Well, hello, everybody. Um, my name is Kelsey Jagger, and I'm the warehouse manager here at YYC Growers and Distributors. Um, I'm a settler on Treaty 7 territory, which is the traditional territory of the Kainai, Pukani, Tsitsika, Tsitsina, the Stony Nakoda, Wesley, Bears Paw, Chiniki Nations, and the Metis Nation of Region 3. Um, and I'd like to acknowledge these groups as we would not be able to farm or live on this stolen land without um, their ongoing stewardship of it um, and making sure that uh, this land has been here for us to continue to live on. Um, so I would just want to acknowledge the land in that way and I'd invite you to go and, and interact with the land and how you feel comfortable with today and how that nurtures your relationship with it. Um, as we head into the spring and everything is getting green and beautiful again. Um, so thank you for joining our YYC Growers Education Series. Um, the series is focused on helping Calgarians connect to their food systems and the amazing people behind it who are some of our presenters today. Um, and now if you've never heard of YYC Growers and Distributors, so we're a farmer owned cooperative that works to ensure local, fresh and nutrient dense food grown in Calgary and in the Southern Alberta area, makes it into the bellies of our, of our subscribers um, on a weekly or, or bi-weekly basis. So if you'd like to have a little bit more information, you can visit yycgrowers.com to learn more. Um, and I also have a discount code at the end that can be applied for new subscribers. Um, and I'll share that with you and you can write it down. And if you want produce that is fresh and local and seasonal, feel free to sign up. This week we've got radishes and asparagus and fiddleheads that are popping up. Next week there might be strawberries. So um, pretty exciting stuff happening here as we head into the spring. Uh, but today I'm joined by Sarah and Marcus Friedner um, and they're from Happiness by the Acre. So I'm very excited to have them here today. So how are you two doing? Good. Good. Yep. <laughs> We're only at the beginning of the growing season, so we are still smiley and full of energy. See us later, and <laughs> yeah. we'll be dragging a little bit by August. <laughs> you two? Never. I don't think you guys ever have the capacity to drag your feet. <laughs> um, cool. Well, today we're actually going to be talking about raising meat birds. Um, but for starters, let's learn a little bit more about Sarah and Marcus. So if you want to please introduce yourself and uh, tell us how you two got into farming. You want first? I love it. Okay. You're going first. Uh, so my name is Sarah and um, I'm a first generation farmer and born and raised in Calgary. So um, pretty local. And um, I work on the farm, mostly doing a lot of the um, animal care um, uh, for all the chickens and cows and ducks and such. And um, I also do all the marketing and social media for our farm. Um, but I do that also for YYC Growers. I'm one of the staff um, that does a lot of work for them as well. And uh, yeah. Also a mom of two, I should mention that. We have two boys two, two that boys. if you hear them in the background, that's what's going on. <laughs> yeah, you'll, you, you may hear Octonauts, uh, which is currently babysitting our youngest. Uh, <laughs> uh, my name's Marcus. Uh, I am a first generation farmer as well. Uh, I started as an urban farmer in Calgary, um, growing vegetables and produce in people's backyards. And then over time, we've transitioned out here to a uh, large property in Carstairs. Um, well, large for us, uh, it's 153 acres. Um, and we've slowly transitioned out of doing any of the vegetable production and are now doing almost only uh, pasture-based proteins. Uh, we do eggs, uh, meat birds, um, and we also do uh, custom grazing and graze cattle. Um, and this year we're going to start having grass fed beef and we're adventuring into pork as well. So we're going to be raising uh, Kuni Kuni pasture based pork. Um, and uh, my job here is, I don't know, <laughs> building, building really dodgy construction projects and uh, fixing, fixing, fi fixing, fixing things. <laughs> and uh, I chase cows around and I do quite a bit of the high level planning yeah. um, and kind of organization of how to keep all the little plates spinning and keep all the animals moving to maximize the health of our pastures and our soil regeneration. Um, and where are you guys located? Just to give people a mental map of where Happiness by the Acre is. 
Uh, so we are halfway between Carstairs and Didsbury, Alberta. So we're just a little bit west of the QE2 corridor. We're probably about an hour north of Calgary. Awesome, thank you. Um, and yeah, I guess Sarah, you touched on it a little bit, but for the two of you, what's your connection to uh, YYC Growers? Um, so Marcus got involved with YYC Growers when it was just getting going. Um, and uh, we were, so we were one of the first group of farms to start in with their CSA program. And at the time we were doing urban farming, um, Marcus was doing uh, market gardening in backyards along his commute to work. And so he would just go there before and then after work and then harvest veggies. And then that went to YYC Growers um, to their Harvest Box program. And then we also had a little CSA of our own just with family and friends. And then um, over the years we've done, we've hosted some of the markets and Marcus was involved heavily on the board and we've just kind of always had our hands in there somewhere trying to help out with the organization. So um, it was my turn to, to get on staff and actually do some work as well. So that's why I'm doing that. Well, you know, I love all the marketing and the social media. So that's why I'm there too. So, yeah. Awesome. Um, so Sarah is, uh, again, an amazing visual designer, and she made this super cool presentation for us. Um, so I am just going to share my screen so that everybody can see this wonderful slide that she made. Let me know if everyone can see that. Is that good? Awesome. Um, so yeah, I guess a big question for you two. So you guys are practicing regenerative agriculture practices and principles. Um, so do you want to talk about that a little bit? I know there's, it's been in the news a lot. It's been like big thing. A lot of big corporations are, are buying onto it, but it really starts at a small scale level. So for you guys, what does regenerative agriculture mean for your farm? Um, so when we wanted to look at doing, like when farming first came into um onto the radar for us to do as a living because like i said we're first generation this wasn't something that we um uh were just raised into or anything like that we we sought this out and we're very intentional intentional about what we wanted to do for the type of farming um here and so the main reason for getting into farming was because we kept hearing more and more about small farms dying off, about um, just in terms of um, rules and governance changing so that it was making it harder and harder for small farms to exist in Canada and North America, across the world, basically. And so we really wanted our kids to grow up knowing where their food came from how it actually grows it doesn't just show up at the grocery store there's a lot of work that goes into it way down the line um and so uh when we were looking at starting a family we knew that we this was knowledge we wanted to pass down to our kids and and learn ourselves and so um as marcus was poking around into how we should how we should farm um, this these ideas are what came up the regenerative agriculture um, doing small scale mixed farming and eventually it became um, realizing that connection to actually being able to reverse climate change so it's not we weren't just seeking out to do sustainable farming for um, the environment it was about actually improving um, from um, deep down in the ground all the way up um, to the food that we're eating. Do you have more? Yeah. You want to you go for no, it? No, that was fantastic. Oh. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, um, like uh, my original interest in, in agriculture and regenerative ag started way, way back in the apartment days living in Vancouver. Um, and uh, it became really, like I come from an environmentalist kind of background on some of this. It became really apparent that our, our largest touch point um, as a civilization is agriculture. Um, that's, that's where we do the most change to the environment and that's where we have the single biggest impact on ecosystems. And so that really, you know, I was, you know, really into like saving trees and planting forests and, and saving whales and all of that fun stuff. But it became very apparent that, that if we're going to have any sort of, uh, long-term viability, we needed to figure out how to raise food 
in a manner that wasn't replacing ecosystems, mm. but was actually partnering with them. And so uh, that's kind of, that led me down a number of rabbit trails through uh, folks like Joel Salatin and Wendell Berry and into permaculture. And um, I've looked at just about everything at this point. Um, and then taking all those different uh, pieces of information and then retooling that, inf that knowledge uh, to our local concept, because, because it is, you know, doing this sort of regenerative farming is very much about what it's like on your particular land. Um, it's really hard to come up with a hard and fast set of rules that apply universally. Um, even within a zone, even you with, know, like yeah. it's not just, not yeah. just by zone, it's literally the actual piece of property, property that you're working yeah. with. Yeah. Yeah. And there's even areas on our farm where I do different things in one area. Um, like there's 20 acre chunk where we do something different than what we would do on the rest of the property. Um, and that's just about observing the land and, and understanding how to work with the ecosystem rather than fight against it. Mm -hmm. so yeah, and why, making that relationship yeah. with your place that you're on. <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, which is why it takes a lot of time too, though, uh, like in terms of doing that observation. And like, so, I mean, we bought the property but we didn't do anything to it for years um, because we were just waiting, watching, observing, seeing it in different seasons and how the water flows off of it naturally, where what's going on. Um, and so that's the big part of it is the working with nature and not against it, even down to the point of with predators. Um, you know, we're, we're not out there chasing them all away. And it's just part of the natural systems out here. And we have to work with them as well. Um, so yeah, we've done lots of work with um, fencing out particular areas of our property that are have been left natural and wild, um, and that has increased um, biodiversity there. And then and it keeps the cattle out, so they're not um, being destructive to those areas. It's protecting the water. Um, we've put in um, a significant dugout to, to manage our water for yeah. um, collecting runoff um, and any rain. We do cover cropping on different. Um, parts when uh, when it needs it um, we take the compost from the the mobile chicken coops that all gets spread out into the pasture to help revitalize the areas where the chickens have been sitting um, we don't use pesticides and, mm -hmm. um, and fertilizers and uh, last year our big the big project that went in was the shelter belts because um, there aren't um, a whole lot of uh, shelter belts in the middle of our farm um so 30,000 no no that I don't know. <laughs> a lot of trees there's a lot of trees <laughs> Too many to count. I can't every time I think of it I'm yeah. like I don't know what the number was it's, something we put it we put in an eco buffer and it it's linear length is pretty close to three kilometers worth of of linear length I think it's about six or seven thousand trees total hmm um and shrubs and that one is designed not uh not like a typical prairie shelter belt it's a messy mix of everything um and it's it's meant to attract birds and and be a, a ecosystem component on the farm as well as for us the big one is Beautiful. catching catching snow and and catching moisture providing shade for animals and and kind of just breaking up the the landscape from wind because um, if there's anything we have lots of here at our place, it's wind. We have <laughs> endless, endless amounts of wind. Apparently, some, yeah, yeah. Some. <laughs> awesome. Um, and so, as your livestock farmers, um, ethical practices um, and livestock farming, like for many people, they don't seem to go hand in hand. So, for ethical farming and raising livestock, how do you two go about that? Um, it's a it's definitely a journey so it was still like it's um like last year was the first time we did meet birds and so that was um it is a journey in terms of um reconciling that in in ourselves i think um in uh yeah using animals for food like we're not we've never been vegetarians and we've always eaten meat but a long ago we made the switch to trying to eat as much of that as like direct from farmers so we we would buy our half cow for the year and have it in the deep freeze we've done that for over 10 years, 10 years yeah. 
um, and things like that. Or when we had friends with pigs, we would get some pork from them and so forth. So um, in our own lives, it was something that we became very um, intentional with in terms of consuming it. And so as we were looking at regenerative agriculture, I mean, the only way for us to start actually improving the soil health on our farm was to use livestock. There's no other way to do it. Uh, there has to be cows out there and, um, and the, and the chickens and, and the pork will play into that as well. And I for us, the ethical farming, it, it, it's these four things. Often when you, if you Google eco, ethical farming, it's going to talk about being. I've also added better for farmers because um, for our own mental health and our own satisfaction in life, um, our connection to the environment, connection to deeply spiritual connection to the animals this it's also better for us as well so we're in that mix too mm -hmm. um and so it means being um so like our animals do come first even the meat birds we know we we purchase them as stale chicks we know that they are going to be raised up um for meat they are going to go and get slaughtered but still um like we give them all the love and attention that we would any other animal like it's a, it's deep care um it's not looking at them as um some kind of profit or or just a an item for us to sell like that's not we recognize them as actual um living individuals and mm -hmm. with personalities i mean these they're they're all of them are very unique like you, you just don't lump them in and say they're meat birds there's you know they're yeah they have personalities mm -hmm. so um so we do everything in terms of um what we can handle to make sure that we're giving them the best life that they can live so a chicken is fully a chicken for the time that it lives um and uh, and same with the, the cows and our ducks um and then better for the environment that goes back this is the big part of the regenerative agriculture element so um the way we're using our, our way we raise our livestock i don't want to say use them because they're just yeah. they are a tool but they're yeah it's the way we are raising them and giving them their space on the farm is improving the environment um it's decreasing our 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 footprint um and in, improving the soil and then uh, like i touched on better for the farmers and also better con for the consumers then too it's it's healthier meat it's healthier food um you have that direct connection to the animal to your farmer to eating local and i think that that it just kind of swirls around because if you're a more if you're a more educated better consumer um you're making better choices you're supporting the local economy um and it just keeps going so yeah, yeah i mean a lot of our yeah do you have more i'm gonna ramble yeah, yeah. <laughs> well like like for me there's a there's a pretty hefty spiritual and philosophical component that is that is part of what an ethical farming practice is. Um, and it really, it really starts with understanding how ecosystems function and the role that, that Homo sapiens play in that ecosystem. Because we're not separate from an ecosystem, we're part of it. And so when it comes to working with with livestock and and partnering with them and partnering with the soil and and the entire biological food web that we're we're working with here it's it, it's it's really about a, a managing things as a as a conceptual whole mm -hmm. and not separating everything off like like the this notion that I'm separate from the land and the cow is separate from me. And, and that starts to fall apart really quickly uh, when you really start focusing on, on the environmental and ecosystem side of things, because you, you can't carve things off into these little dualistic separate pieces because the, the relationship between myself as the, the guy who pulls the chicken coop to a new spot every week and the grass and that chicken and that egg and then that egg going to a customer in Calgary and that customer sending their cartons back to us all these things play together and form this kind of like whole that is is what we 
I often use the word manage, but the word manage isn't really, that brings this business concept. It's, it's more like a guided partnership, mm -hmm. right? It's a participatory thing. So that's, that's kind of how, like from that foundation and that con conceptual understanding, that's where the ethics and where, how we would treat things kind of stems from and, and moves outwards. Mm -hmm. Awesome. And uh, yeah, there is a lot of things you do for ethical farming practices as well. Like some of them that are, are listed here, like low stress handling, having a lot of space, um, especially rotational grazing, then they get like the most nutrient food for your animals as they're traveling around. Um, yeah, and, and I heard you talk about a lot of this kind of throughout. Um, so this is, is a really awesome one to know that the animals are getting cared for. And um, yeah, Marcus and Sarah are for YYC growers are kind of putting together raising standards for livestock that we are gonna set as a bar for other producers to try to implement across their farm. So I think these two are especially setting a pretty high standard for what it means to care for animals and to give them kind of the best nutrient dense food that they can have um, and grow their bodies nice and strong. And also remembering that uh, everything is, is sentient. If you, if you cut down a, a piece, a crop of corn, or if you pull strawberries, like they're all these living beings. So even the idea that you can look after those plants as well and feed your soil is, is really awesome and important. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Yeah, I, 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 we didn't really exactly touch on the, um, being um, taking responsibility for euthanizing animals when they're suffering, and also the fact that with the, like our meat birds and any of them, it's um, we're looking always at the most quick humane death that we can give for them. Um, it's something that we get. That's the biggest point that we get criticized for for being livestock uh, farmers is always about the death side of things and the suffering of animals, and it's just like death is for us like, I mean that for everyone it's a part of life you can't there is it's there you can't avoid it and so we just take responsibility for for that when if, if there if an animal is suffering unduly then we euthanize it as quickly as possible we're not going to try and drag that out for them just because we we're not trying to make money off of that that's mm -hmm. no thank you mm -hmm. um and uh, with the in terms of how we choose um for the end of life for our animals it's always trying to look at the most humane option possible that we are capable of doing or, or or seeking out like with the meat birds they get um sent to slaughter so mm -hmm. um yeah i just wanted to bring that up as a <laughs> always it's oh as we yeah. <laughs> we we found on instagram when we were posting about the the uh webinar we got a little bit of backlash and some ugliness about this and it's something that we just we face mm -hmm. as soon as we bring it up but yeah yeah, yeah. Um, and then ethical farming practices. You mentioned this earlier too, Marcus, was uh, working with nature and, and not against it. And I think that is a big problem with a lot of kind of big commercial farmers and that you see happening is, is trying to control how they grow certain things instead of planting things and raising animals in a way that goes with the cycles of, again, what's happening on your farm and, and being able to notice where there's more moisture, where cows shouldn't go because there's so much moisture and, and stuff like that. Um, and so, yeah, for ethical farming practices, even just better for the environment, um, your livestock play a really big role in actually making sure that all those nutrients make it back into the ground. So actually having your cows in pasture um, from all of their their cow patties are adding all of that back into the soil. Hugely significant. Everything that the cows do, they, I mean, they turned our farm around um, since it, it started out as a grain farm when we purchased it and um, that it's back to pasture now. And mm -hmm. again, we couldn't have done that without the cows. Yeah. It's been like, like if I didn't have the soil, uh, the soil data from testing, I would not believe what has happened in our soil. I would consider it just a straight up lie. Um, <laughs> Right, like, like we went from, we had, when we took over the farm, we had pockets of our farm that were at half a percent organic matter. Um, when we brought the cows in, we had been in grass uh, for two seasons and we were at averaging about 2% uh, organic matter across the farm. And then uh, four years of cows and we are at seven to 10%. Yeah. Um, and for, for those who don't know, that's insanely fast. That, that was our 25 year plan. 
Yeah, our 25 Not year plan was to, <laughs> to hand the farm off to whoever's going to use it next with with organic matter in the seven to 10 in seven to 10 percent range in the top six inches. Our new goal, because we did that in under four years, our new goal is to get it to 15 percent in the top six and uh, double digits down to 18 inches. So that's my new life goal. Um, <laughs> and what this represents for, for climate change is an astronomical amount of carbon that is bound out of the atmosphere and back into the soil biology. Mm -hmm. um, I figure that we're currently binding, I think, we, I think after you take out cow farts and trucks and electricity and all the other things that go into running a farm and having livestock, including the feed we bring in mm -hmm. for chickens, uh, we've now bound 7,500 metric tons of carbon in four years on 153 acres. Ooh, I have um, a question from Mike. Mike is asking, yeah. are you monetizing your carbon renewal? We do not have a way to monetize our carbon renewal. There is no, there is no government or, or private system that will allow us to do that because we're using livestock. But the hope is... If you have a program, Mike, uh, send us a URL because <laughs> I will get on that so fast you wouldn't believe it. Um, my estimate is that, that the market value right now for the carbon we've bound is probably around $300,000. Um, Interesting. Nori carbon market. Is, sorry, I'm going to ask, uh, uh, Mike, is, is the Nori carbon market, is that a private thing or is... That, oh, no, it's not. Yeah, Canada. Nori's not in Canada. Okay. Cool. okay. Um, my hope is that my hope for the carbon sequestration side is that the, the government starts giving farmers access, direct access to the taxation pool on the carbon tax. Mm -hmm. um, because that's an acceler that that taxation pool is an accelerating price over time. And um, if that were the case, I would just start leasing land all over and I would make all my money binding carbon. Mm -hmm. um, I have a I have a quick that. question for you that's kind of sidebar. Yes, but go on. We'll round I was <laughs> I was reading that methane is not caused from cow farts but cow burps. Yes, and it is you? from cow burps. Yes, it is. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> it is. It is from cow burps. Cool. They are not farting out there. As you <laughs> you, if you walk by, they're going to give you a good old burp in the face more than an animal. Yeah, um, and uh, <laughs> there is there is some new research saying that uh, that if you do a certain seaweed supplement, it will reduce uh, the methane production from cow burps by up to 80%. We are looking into that. It's not commercialized and it is not approved by the Canada Food Inspection Agency. So I cannot use it yet, but as soon as we can, we will be supplementing that into our cow's mineral. Um, and uh, then we will be binding even more carbon. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, yeah. And then again, for ethical farming, we have like connecting to farmers. So um, intensely connecting you to their living um, and all this stuff is is awesome for ethical farming as well and I, that's something that we try to do here at see growers as well is make sure that people are connected to their farmers so when you get eggs and you see happiness by the acre on the box you're like oh, i know sarah and marcus like i know that their farm is out like in the temporary area and they have two beautiful boys and you know and you could visit it's, and you can visit it's an open farm door policy so yeah. oh awesome um, so yeah, so it is, it is awesome for farmers. Um, again, it keeps these two very excited about what they do and where they work. Um, and then lastly, yeah, so it, it is really good for consumers as well. So um, especially if we're talking about pasture-raised animal and pasture-raised chickens um, and meat birds, for example, what's the benefit of the pasture-raised meat birds for consumers, let's say, who buy um, meat chickens from you guys? Well, the... The, the nutritional data studies are still coming out on this, um, but uh, the, the data studies that we've looked at have found that first and foremost, the, the fat profile in a pasture-raised chicken um, is uh, your omega-3, 6, and 9 are balanced uh, and tuned to the same level as, say, salmon. So it becomes the, the fat profile in the bird is very healthy. Um, pasture-raised birds tend to be leaner in general um, just because they are working more. Um, and that does mean that you have, uh, have more flavor in the meat as well. Um, the, the act of, of exercising and, and moving around and foraging and eating a wider variety of things 
uh, that it, that has a big impact on the flavor of the meat. Um, and uh, that's sort of one of those uh, kind of quality things that is unique to an individual farm. Mm -hmm. So the flavor of the soil uh, is going to translate into the flavor of the grass and then into the flavor of the of the meat. Um, so, so meat birds that are raised here on our farm are going to taste different than meat birds that would be raised five, 10 miles away from here because the soil is going to have a different, different mineralogy and profile in it. So you're going to get different flavors into the grass and into the meat itself. Um, now with poultry, because the birds are on the, on the grass for such a short lifespan, um, it's not as big of a flavor difference, but with something like beef, you will really taste the you'll taste the land in the meat um right so it, that's that's kind of one of those things for consumers that's really interesting because you can have a different flavor from one farm to the next um and you know some people want a uniform flavor but this also provides you this really wonderful experience of the local and it really does connect you back to the land in what you're eating through what you taste mm -hmm. um and uh that's kind of, for me, that as a foodie, that's one of the most interesting <laughs> things is being able to taste the soil. And I'm one of those weirdos who actually does taste the soil. I've eaten our soil. <laughs> I taste our compost. Oh, yes. <laughs> uh, I also have tasted all of the feeds that we give to our animals and all of their supplements, yep. um, including uh, there's a video of in, on Instagram of me of eating a handful of dried soldier fly larvae out there absolutely delicious i highly recommend everybody gets used to eating insects because eating insects is fantastic um so if you start sprouting some feathers i'll know what the deal is here yeah. it's just getting into the feed hey oh yes rod you tried them when you were here they they taste our state our soldier fly larva that we feed our chickens is tastes kind of like it's nutty nutty popcorn yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's the best yeah. way i could describe yeah. it yeah um yeah, and I think that's something too, like again, tasting the soil. I had, I don't know, I'm so used to eating the food from, from here at work where it's grown by these amazing local growers. And then I wasn't at work for a week and I had to go to, to a store and get carrots. And I was like, this soil was not loved. No, <laughs> you can not taste loved soil. soil. That's what it is. I know. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we're going to just move on to some, uh, some info about meat birds. Um, so you guys are choosing to grow uh, a kind of uncommon meat bird. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Um, yeah, so I did this slide up real quick just to show the, the significant difference in the, so when you're talking about ethical farming and animal welfare, one of our big things is that like, we are not interested in having a fast growing chicken. So our meat birds that we choose are not a fast growing, um, no, normal, typical commercial uh, broiler that you would think of. Normally people picture the white broilers. That's not what we do. Um, and the, one of the, I mean, we were looking, there were several different reasons for the the one that we chose is called uh, a mistral brie. I was called mistral brie, but I think it's a mistral brie. Um, and it's, uh, we chose it because it's a really good forager. It does well on pasture, um, but um, it also is a heritage breed that, um, um, it grows faster than a like purebred heritage breed. So we are, we are able to, to turn around and sell it, but it's nowhere near as fast as your typical commercial breed. Right now, typical commercial breeds uh, for a broiler, it's between four and seven weeks for them to finish. And to me, that's just, I'm not interested in having an animal for four to seven weeks and then selling it because what, I don't know what life, like that's not a life, that's not, that's yeah. not enough. That's not enough for me to be satisfied and okay with that. And that to, you know, farmers have to figure that out for themselves, but that was a really big thing for us. So the, the this way we are, the, the Mistral Grease are about 12 weeks. Last year we did about 14 weeks. Um, and so you can yeah, mostly last, because- Last year we accidentally had some hit 15 weeks. But that was like- <laughs> we, had a we, had a problem getting, we had a problem getting into a processor. Yes. Yeah, so and so, so we had giant turkey sized chickens. There was some biggies, but they were doing, like they're still doing really good. So so yeah. it's uh so yeah so they're around they do get to live longer then and so that the, the comparison there on the chart was just looking back 
back in the 1920s before they were really bringing in these highly bred commercial breeds, um, it was about 17 weeks um, to get a chicken up to weight. So that's a comparison there. It's yeah. a crazy the, chart. I would never would yeah. have thought that that was like so much of a difference there. Yes. Yeah. 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 One of the other things with the, the Mistral Gris is um, there's only one, there's only one hatchery uh, in North America that raises them and breeds them out. Um, it's a four-way cross, so it's actually quite a complicated bird to, to breed and, and have breed true. Yeah. Um, and uh, Emily at, uh, at True North Farms, True North Hatchery uh, in Vernon, BC is where we get them from. Um, she's the only one doing them in, in, in Alberta, or sorry, in Canada. Um, and she's completely independent. Uh, like if we were to go to like a rustic ranger or to um, some of the other, other more heritage breeds um, or a, a Cornish cross, all of those actually come from one mega company. Mm -hmm. It's um, pretty much monopoly. It's a, there's on, basically on for, the for genetics and for buying your hatched chicks, it's a monopoly. I believe the company, the parent company is called Avignon yeah. or, or something along those lines. Um, so by using the Mistral Gris, we're also participating in a smaller, more localized economy that is is supporting small independent hatchery uh, out of BC. And encouraging yeah. that continued genetic and breeding. Yeah. Things, like keeping that unique. So yeah, because the Mistral Gris almost went extinct. Its origins are from the US. Um, and they're, they're originally were bred out on uh, Amish farms. Um, and the Amish being the Amish, they didn't, the, none of this was on the internet. None of this was, was anywhere um, until somebody found them uh, in direct, direct contact and, and Emily was able to get those genetics up here. So it's a really, it's a really fascinating story. It's all on, on their hatcheries website. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it, it kind of just creates this more interesting, for me, this more interesting animal to, to partner with rather than just something production oriented mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah yeah and i see yeah. this one benefit of of Michel gris is the cold hardy and with the snow Absolutely. everyone yeah. just got you know very important <laughs> it is and the fact that they feather out quickly so that we can get them onto the pasture young like they're the we we have like a week and a half old um uh, chicks right now and they're still in our barn under heat lamps because that's they're still itty bitty babies but they're feathering out really quickly and so they can get back out on they can go out onto the pasture sooner rather than later um and uh yeah like one of the big things with is not having um to be concerned about heart conditions which is a huge problem with some of the commercial um typical breeds of um, broilers they just because of the way they're grown to grow or their genetics for growing fast um quite often they have a there's a condition it's like sudden death basically for um broilers because of the they outgrow their heart <laughs> yeah. it's just um that's part of that and so you don't have to we don't have to worry about that kind of um, problem with these um they are our drawbacks like so they are slower growing so you know we we um, for us, we're only doing two batches of them uh, in, a, in a growing season. Um, if we were doing faster growing, we could do more batches. Again, that goes back to what are we really, why are we doing it? Um, they, so they're, because they're slower growing, they're going through a little bit more feed and they're with us, it takes more time. So they cost more. Um, it's a higher price point. We can't necessarily get that cost down for uh, reaching more consumers, right? It's not a, it's not an inexpensive broiler bird, unfortunately. No. So it's, it's just one of those things you get one and you really enjoy it. You make the most out of it. You make your stock, you use every little bit of it. Um, and that's how you get that benefit. Um, and, uh, you know, the draw, drawback a bit is that there is only the one hatchery in Canada. So if something happens to um, her genetics or her hatchery, then we're out of luck. Um, and you guys should start one. <laughs> oh, I'm not. In, I'm not ready. I'm not ready for that. I'm not ready for the breeding and the. Oh, that's, that's like. You know what? We'll be ready next spring. Oh, it's, it's all good. <laughs> Add it to the docket. We're already getting. Yeah. Or <laughs> um, but yeah, let's like let yeah. So I was gonna say, make sure we move along. I would want to make sure to show the little chick guys have time. Oh, um, look at these. Yeah. So these are the chicks that come um, in a box. 
Um, and uh, <laughs> they uh, last year they came by plane. And then because they're coming from BC this year, they came by truck. That was the only way that she was able to get them delivered. So um, I'm not sure yet what, what, in terms of stress, what if one of one or the other was better or not, um, they're still too young to sort of see some of that. But yeah, they're little balls of fluff and they do kind of come in um, a bit of variety. They're not all just um, straight up uh, black and yellow, the black ones, like there's mm -hmm. some variety to them. Um, and they're tiny, like they're a lot tinier than our, um, our uh, laying hens when they come. So uh, yeah, so this is the brooder that we have set up in the barn. Um, we actually use the um, enclosed coop area that we have for overwinter when we have our hens overwintered. And this is where they go in to lay. And so we clean it all out and um, pull all the perches and stuff out of there and then hang a lot of heat lights and uh, um, get them all nice and cozy and warm in there. Um, and uh, there's no draft and stuff like that. So that's all good. And um, basically they just eat and drink and sleep and run around. So that <laughs> <laughs> they're yeah. all they're like toddlers at this stage for if you're trying to compare they they still do the just stand there and then like fall asleep while you know eating and drinking yeah. and, <laughs> and, and any they, toys that you put in there not for these guys yeah. you know last year i i'm used to the laying hens and we always give with our laying hens we always do sticks and perches and rot like things even early on for them to get climbing up on and last year i, I kind of did that with these but um they are growing so much faster than our laying hens we had some injure their legs um and thing like they're just yeah. they're like if you like I would think of them as being really clumsy chicks. Like they're just, they're not, it's best if they just stay on the ground. Yeah. <laughs> and so I, it was one of those lessons learned. Um, and uh, it's just it, one of those differences between uh, a meat bird and uh, a laying hen. It's, yeah. I would have thought chick is a chick and they need a little something. But. Yeah. They, they grow in the first, in the first four weeks, they double in weight every seven days. Like they, they, they it's phenomenally fast. How fast, like they're just, race cars for the first four weeks which frightens um, me thinking about what a like yeah like and, and when we consider like a cornish cross is at slaughter weight in four weeks i, I just, they I must think, just sit there and eat and that's about it and you can probably watch them, them grow, grow right? i guess i don't know yeah that so, <laughs> but yeah they grow they grow really fast so we found that we're that last year we found that it was tough to to keep them healthy when we gave them enrichment and things to climb on. So this year we're pulling back on that and see how they, see how they do instead. Yeah. And then once they get out, this is the, this is them last year out on pasture. Yeah. Um, so uh, obviously the grass isn't there yet, but it's nice and green out here down uh, with the rain yeah. and the snow. Um, and so, you know, they, they have tons to entertain themselves when they're uh, out on pasture, the bugs and the scratching around and the dirt bathing and all that stuff. Like they're, they're, fully yeah they're good once they get outside yeah. um and we so we do run them in um these little mobile coops that Lachlan made um for us and so it's just a, a tarp covering so they can be cool and warm like they it works pretty good for the temperature and for um it was only in August when you get some heat that they were getting warm but they cast enough shadow for most of the day that they get some shade that they're mm -hmm. They're okay and we do run electric fencing around each of the pens with the meat birds to keep we do we have lots of predators um so that's it's more about just keeping um the predators at bay than um than keeping the, the hens in all the like these guys don't fly they're not flighty so they don't go and over. do the meat birds go after the cattle after you're doing rotational grazing stuff do they follow we, along we haven't been able to get that timing down yet um we're finding we're still trying to figure out how to time the cattle. Uh, so what we've been doing instead is, is the chickens and the poultry are following the cows basically a year behind. So in an area where we had a lot of cattle impact um, and lots of manure and, and lots of, of that sort of action, that's kind of where we put the, the, the egg layers and our meat birds the next season where we start to yes yeah, and to and then we start moving them through so we're still we're still fine-tuning how that process works part of it is the number of birds that we have yeah. like if i had more birds it'd be easier to follow the herd closer um 
And then the other part of it is just kind of coordinating all the different moving parts in the animal operation and what actually works out to be the most efficient for the business and healthiest for the animals. So right now we're not 100% where I'd like it to be, but uh, the every, learning every, process. Year, every year we get a little tighter. I was like, it's only week, to, or only kind of a year or two for the meat birds. So yeah. We're good. <laughs> we're still got lots to learn. Um, and so these are the, this is what the mistral grease look like when they're full grown. And it is, they are unsexed. So it's a full mix of um, roosters and um, hens. And we don't, um, last year, like I've heard different um, ideas on that. Some people like to, to separate out their roosters from the hens um, for the meat birds. Um, we didn't have issues with them being together. The idea was just that the roosters can be a little bit more protective of the food. And so then the hens don't get to grow, but we, they were pretty, they were pretty good. We, uh, we kept an eye on that thinking we might need to separate them out, but we just kept them together. So, um, so yeah, they're, I mean, they're gorgeous birds um, and um, just, they're super lovely. And this is actually, these are photos of, from the night before they went into, um, into slaughter. So, yeah. Um, yeah. And, uh, yeah. Does anyone have any questions for Sarah and Marcus? I'll stop. Well, I'm going to go grab a, well, they think we, we I'm going to grab chicks. We have oh. chicks. We have baby ones that we can show you real, real live baby. Mr. Agree. Guys, this is why I'm here. These ones, I think they're, they are 10 days old today. Yeah. 10 days old today. Oh, awesome. Yeah. Or if anyone doesn't feel comfortable in muting themselves and asking a question, feel free to pop it in the chat and I'll, uh, yeah, you bet. I'll let Sarah and Marcus know. Oh, no, here comes our here comes our toddler too. Here the toddler and the chickens. Gotta love it. The chicks, chicks of both species. Here we come. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, you can see how, oh, 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 how much bigger they are even at, um, do you want to grab them? He's going to go for one. He's going to go for one. <laughs> um, so last year was your first year raising meat birds. Like what's the challenge have you learned going into this year? Um, so that, that one, that big part of the fact that they are significantly different than laying hens, it's not just that chickens are chickens, um, and learning that bit of difference. Um, and also just that, um, figuring out that, um, the animal, the, I mean, just it's still, I'm an animal lover. I'm a, I, you know, it's that still being okay with sending an animal off to slaughter. Like we, the cattle we graze are not our own. This will be the first year that we finish some off um, for beef. So we've never, um, you know, I say goodbye to the cows before they go off um, to, to slaughter, but they aren't our own. And it, that's not, that's never been our decision. And so I think that was one big gentle. thing last year was like, no, no, just learning to reconcile some of that. And like, you Can are responsible for their death, right? Like it's, yeah. um, and, but again, going back to why we're doing this and, and the fact that, so we raised them so we can eat them. I mean, we kept back lots of these birds and they've been feeding our family through the winter. So, um, and, and yeah, so mm -hmm. that's been a big one to learn too. He's gonna. I know. Come around again. <laughs> Sorry, I gotta... chicken. Does anyone chicken. else have any any questions for these two? Uh, I just got pooped on. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, Santa. I have a question. Yeah, getting pooped on is part of the process, right? <laughs> yeah, I'll put it down. Oh, there you go. Yeah, I've been uh, raising quail in in Bonas for the last five years, and. Um, I've been buying the black soldier larvae too. And I was just curious where you guys were getting yours from. Uh, we bought it from a company called Entera. Uh, they're out of Airdrie. Uh, the smallest amount that they will sell you is 300 kilograms. Ah, wow. But if you, if we have lots, if you're looking for some, let, uh, just shoot us an email and we'll, I've got, 200 kilograms kicking around right now so if you're interested in them we can we'll we'll make a deal it was one of the things we actually thought of to offset some of the cost of bringing them in was we are able to repackage and resell them and so we're like 
backyard hen owners and such would be like this would be a good thing for them so and that's yeah. starting in calgary to be legal pretty soon so you guys are gonna have more business than you think <laughs> the other question i had was whether you'd looked into kind of <laughs> certifications or other kinds of certifications and what you thought the balance was whether they were worth uh so one of the one of the challenges with certification is um you kind of there's certain things that we do on our farm that invalidate us for certain certifications for example, um, we'll, we'll bring in waste product from YYC growers and feed that to our chickens or feed it into our compost. And that is a nightmare for certification. Um, there just really isn't a, a clean way to certify for organic or certify for certain things. Yes, I know. Um, so largely what we've done is we've avoided any specific certification. Um, and instead, we focused on just being really transparent with our customers and, and with uh, anybody that we're dealing with on what it is that we do on our farm. Mm -hmm. um, so in a way, we're, we're customer certified rather than ah, 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 gentle, gentle, gentle. Yeah. Uh, rather than, than certifying body certified. And we also right. found the cost on some things like, like you know, like doing something like, sort of like organic certification and things like that. It just it's too prohibitive at our small scale. Um, right. It, yeah. Yeah. That doesn't. It, it, yeah. So far, that hasn't worked yeah. for us. When we've looked into it. So, um, but yeah, being transparent and um, and being open to people coming and visiting and seeing how actually everything is done for us feels more significant than than being able to have some labels and some um, certifications. Cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, I want to come and visit now. Yeah, yeah. 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 You guys are, anybody's <laughs> welcome to come and visit. Oh, sorry. The chickens are changing our, oh. our Zoom stream. It's like, where did it go? <laughs> they're they're uh, using the back pad. <laughs> uh -oh. Yeah. And that's something that we're trying to set up with a lot of farmers too, Santa, with, uh, with YYC Growers engagement stuff that we're doing is actually setting up a time with farmers to go do a farm visit, but these two are open to you showing up at any time. So that's awesome. You can yeah. you guys just go. Yeah, um, we just ask that uh, give uh, give us a text on our phone number. It's Our phone numbers are easy to get a hold of or shoot us an email just so that we can have somebody around and uh, so that you don't uh, accidentally wander into an uh, electric fence that's hot or something like that. <laughs> we don't want anybody getting hurt. So. Yeah, it wouldn't be my first time because I was working for the, the people that were doing goat herding around Calgary in the oh, park. Yeah. Right. yeah, so yes. I've been zapped. It's okay. <laughs> yes. Yeah, you, it's part of the part of it. Yeah, I haven't had my first one this year, but we haven't fired up our main electric fence. Yet, so. <laughs> mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, I just wanted to say thank you, everyone, for coming. I'm going to put a promo code in the chat right now so if any of you are interested in getting access to marcus and sarah's um eggs that they have that we get here at yyc growers and hopefully maybe one day we'll be carrying the chickens <laughs> I'm, I'm hoping i'm yes. hoping in august that we're going to have some of our meat uh, going through yyc growers this year yeah yes. amazing awesome and then yeah so this uh yyc education that's the promo code it's all just one word um and if you subscribe to a to a harvest box here which we pull from many different farms that are in southern alberta um to get you fresh nutrient dense food that's grown in really good soil like Marcus was talking about and you can taste the difference um I know Bo whoa I know it's so cool um, <laughs> um but yeah so if you want to enter that code when you um subscribe to a box that would be awesome um but I just wanted to say thank you to Sarah and Marcus for teaching us about meat birds um and I hope uh especially everyone else here feels a little bit more comfortable with uh, where their food comes from and a little bit more connected to to their growers that are here around Calgary. Yeah, and if anybody is um, just interested in more, like we're not experts in raising the meat birds, obviously, like I said, it's only gonna be our second year, but if you're interested in more of like how we're actually doing it or um, any of that kind of, those kind of technical questions, definitely um, email us. <laughs> we're open to share. We're all about sharing our information with others. It's not a not locked box. So yeah. 